And that's actually it. Uh, that's uh, all of our presentation. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's only 7.30. So uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer those. You can yeah, just looks like there's, is, is the mic here? I, for think, I think we're supposed to tell them not to go to the mic. Okay, don't go to the mic. Do it's not, whatever trick. you do. Yeah. It's booby trapped. trapped. Yeah. No. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can just raise your hands. Any, any questions? Right here. So this is kind of a big question. Uh, you mentioned some parts of it uh, in the talk, but I wanted to ask more directly. So as a background, I, I'm mostly a 3.5 player. I played about a year of 40 to get a feeling for it before I switched back. And um, when you went about designing FIP, I was curious how you guys deal with the people like me who like really liked the all the weird niggly bits of three five where you could just do wackadoo stuff, stuff like this bard I'm I'm sublime courting so that he can become sort of a sorcerer and I'm you know war uh, war weavering so that he can just be the best buffer and also I'm gonna optimize the heck out of his 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 inspired courage because. How do you deal with stupid people like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not stupid. Yeah. It's just the way you like to play. Yeah, it's the way right? you like to play. You know, and I think for a lot of us, was saying, you know, we knew we had to kind of pick play styles to support. What we wanted to make sure was, if there's a play style that we couldn't support, it was for a good reason. It was things like, you know what, we could make, and I'm just going to make an example, because this isn't necessarily something we saw in the data, but somebody wants to do a lot of very specific optimization, make lots of, actually, this is actually something we did decide, that making your character, you would make few big decisions rather than very many little decisions. Yes. Because we just found that overall in the d, &D players as a whole, any decision making, you can say 95% of people support this. That still means one out of 20 don't. So we had to make sure if we were moving away from something, it was because overall we saw that d, &D players as a whole, that's really what, they, what they, saw, they wanted us to take the game. And this kind of goes back to, I think earlier before we started recording, we talked about how we weren't in the business of telling people they're playing d, &D that if there's a play style that, that fifth edition doesn't support, we hope you're finding it in an earlier edition, and, and we sell eBooks of the earlier editions and stuff, and that's totally fine by us. We didn't feel the need that everyone has to convert to the new edition. It was much more thinking, what can we do to get the majority of D&D players, current players, happy with the game, and then also make a game that new players can get into? And in, in a lot of ways, we think of it as, like in that specific example, We'd want enough optimization. So let's say you love 3.5, or you love Pathfinder. That, that, that's the game you want to play. You might still love that version of D&D &D more than any other version. But you'd be fine playing 5th, because there's enough of it there that you could play it and enjoy it. So that's something where you know, we do, there is, you know, there's character customization, and the way feats work. You, know, you don't get as many, but they're much bigger. We're kind of trying to like maybe build a little compromise toward that play style. But knowing that if we go too far in that direction, then the game's kind of moving away from the center, and we're losing a lot more people than we're so trying to not cast it as, oh no, everyone who's ever played D&D &D must play this edition, we're gonna you know, take your rule books away or anything like that. More just thinking, what can we do if, it, if this isn't your favorite version of D&D, &D, can we make it your second favorite version of D&D? &D? And then that, having a situation where if you know someone who's DMing a fifth edition game, you might play. Because yeah, yeah it's not exactly what I want. I mean, and D&Ds are, are always had that. You know, it, it, whether it was, well, I'd rather be playing GURPS. Or you know, I really would rather be playing Legend of the Five Rings. I wanna play a samurai, Japanese-inspired role-playing game, but I can't, I'm willing to play, the, but this D&D game is, I like it, it's, it's, it's fun enough that I'm happy playing it. Would I rather be playing something else? Sure, but no, this is, this is good enough, that, that it, it's hitting on enough of the notes that I like, that I'm not repelled by it. So in some ways, it's kind of like, rather than think in terms of D&D versus other role-playing games, it was D&D versus other editions of D&D. <laughs> and so what can we do to appeal to people, but without driving away other people? Yeah, and actually, I think your Feats example is actually a really good one. Um, so. Feats in the game are something we include because we know that people do want to customize their characters and they do want to make some choices to sort of bend their characters in a funky different way. It's also a place where we can you know, expand out in the future if we really want to into weirder places. But we do say that feats are optional. They are not an assumed core part of the game. And so this is part of that sort of compromise we make where it's like, okay, we know that there's a certain play style out there that wants a lot more customization. But we also know that if we include it as a default, that's something we're saying that that is something that has now gotten over the high wall, right? Which is what we talked about before, right? So uh, we compromise by making it an optional rule, and you'll see this more in the Dungeon Master's Guide, which is I, I don't think it's a misnomer to say it's chock full of uh, optional rules, right? But where we do give you that kind of customization, where if you want a game that has more uh, tinkering and, and fiddling in the uh, in your character building, 
we give you ways to do that. And so there's the optional feet rules and the optional multi-classing rules. And you know, again, I think we're both uh, we're all open to the idea that there might be more optional rules down the future down the road that give you even more customization options. Question right here. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so I'm actually really interested in your playtesting. Uh, you noticed, well, you mentioned that uh, it's something new that you were starting to do, uh, collect data and do take polls. Um, well, they, for example, here at DigiPen, they, they teach us to do it because we're going to the video games industry and do that in a lot of the video games industry uh, to learn about the consumer, the user experience, and stuff like that. But it isn't actually something I've noticed a lot of tabletop RPG companies like Izo, I went to IzoCon and asked them about their playtesting methodologies. They have like that one big open playtest, but they don't really playtest anything else because they're always trying to shoot for deadlines. Yeah. And so I'm interested in like, um, but these games have been around for almost long, for a bit longer than video games. So why hasn't that sort of developed? Why so yeah. So I can't speak to what Paizo is doing. I don't know the particulars yeah. of their thing, but I can speak to other tabletop companies. I've and actually, the way we used to do things, and we've changed. Yeah. So uh, let's get a little to like the inside baseball of the industry of the industry. But the, uh, and I'm not saying this is just, just a, my observation. I'm sure other people have different experiences with companies they work at. But one of the things that, that is an issue in tabletop gaming is you're, it's very important for you to stick to a regular sk release schedule, because that's how you keep your revenue coming in for your company. So you release book A, so its revenue can then pay for book B, which then pays for book C, and it keeps the lights on everything. One of the real advantages we have with D&D is we do a lot of licensing for video games and the slot machines, things like that. So we have a lot of revenue coming in that actually keeps the business healthy. We don't need to do a new tabletop role-playing game book every month. And another thing we found, and this wasn't obvious in the slides, but we actually, in one of our play tests, we asked, hey, how many, let's say it's, it's been 10 years since 5th edition came out, how many books have you bought? What's the ideal number? And we're thinking, okay, it'll probably be like around like 20 or 30. The answer was four. Yeah. People said after 10 years, I want to buy four expansions, and then I'm done, which was just, right? I mean, if especially like three, five, and fourth, we're doing multiple books a month. And it was, it was clear now, looking back, we were saturating the market. And so a lot of what we wanted to do was really scale back the number of releases and really focus on that play testing. It's a luxury that we have because we're D&D. I think it's very difficult for other tabletop companies to, to do that. Um, I think in board games, uh, I think there's a reason why uh, board games have taken off is because rather than board game publishers like, say, a Rio Grande uh, um, games, they essentially work much more like, say, traditional publishing does, where, for instance, Stephen King is not an employee of a company that publishes books, and, hey, Stephen, write this month's book. They more say, hey, if you have an idea for a book, send us your manuscript. If we like it, we think it's great, then we'll publish it or put some time into editing it and stuff like that. So what you get in board games is there's much more of the open process, like Rio Grande or whomever, Mayfair, they solicit designs, they review them, they pick the best ones, and those are the ones they publish. And so I think that's a real advantage that, that board games have is they might not have the same exhaustive playtesting that we did in terms of scope and the numbers, but they're only going through and picking the best designs. For a tabletop role-playing game, once your design is out there and people like it, and now you want to support it, you're now kind of on that treadmill of you've got to get everything out every month, and people have already said they like the game, so you're kind of hoping, okay, let's hope we're kind of sticking with what people like, and we're making stuff that's really relevant to people. And I think one of the things that's really hurt role-playing games, uh, if you look at, in any trade thing, people talk, in tabletop gaming, role, everything's growing except role-playing. Role-playing is, like, is, is shrinking. Our data, from what I can tell, there are more people playing tabletop role-playing games now than ever. They're just not buying anything. And I think it goes back to what we saw, yeah. where people actually don't want to buy a new role-playing game every month. Or if they do, they want more like a 64-page game they can pick up and play really quickly. Or you know, they want something that's some genre no one's really messed with before. Or some new, like you mentioned Dread is a game, where, oh, it's like Jenga blocks is part of the game, and it helps add the tension to the table. So I think what's happened is just the business model of role-playing games is outdated in terms of what people actually want, and what actually makes sense for how to make games work. And I think if there's one thing I could do, I know obviously Wizards wouldn't do this because we, we do D&D, but I think it'd be really interesting to, to, to have a theoretical role-playing game publisher that was more like, say, a Mayfair or a Rio Grande, where they actually didn't design the games. They just, hey, if you have a role-playing game design, send it to us, we'll assess it. If we like it, then we'll put some resources against it and publish yeah. it. A lot, a lot of the indie games, like uh, Indie Press Revolution, kind of works that way, where you have individual indie game designers do that kind of thing. Uh, like Mike said, our biggest advantage is the luxury of our resources and time. 
Um, although even we didn't take advantage of it as well as we could uh, previously. Yeah. Also, I think a lot of it, it just sort of grows out of uh, the fact that the method for uh, playtesting up to this point, it was just assumed that the way you did this was you send it out to playtesters, a closed group, they provide you with your feedback, you read through it, and then you act on it, right? But that idea of being sort of more survey driven, like a marketing survey, that just wasn't something that had been done before. Yeah. And I think that it was, I mean, Everything has to be done for the first time sometime, right? Yeah. Uh, it just, it's a little surprising that it took us this long. Uh, we actually, uh, we tried this process out on a board game um, back uh, about a year before um, the open playtest launched. We did a, an open playtest for the Dungeon Command board game. It was a miniature skirmish game, and we, I mean, we basically had to figure out how this process works, but like that's the first time we actually did something like that. And we learned a bunch of lessons, and then we did the open play test here, and then now going forward, we're gonna take the lessons we learned and improve upon it. So we're actually iterating on our process as well as you know yeah. the actual game design. And that's a huge luxury we have. Yeah. We can't afford to do that. Yeah. So. so you had a question right here? Uh, well, I've got a whole bunch of cards covered in them, but that actually covered a lot of the things that I was little little bitty questions. And actually, I'm less, left with one of my less interesting ones, which is uh, you guys mentioned, like, okay, so now we're still looking for problems that are cropping up, and we're still trying to think about it. But of course, you now have these big books that are printed with the information that you can't run into everybody's house and change that. So are you guys excited for 5.5, or <laughs> how is this going to work? We are not excited for 5.5. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's Please, actually, I just it, got done out of crunch time for this, this game. Please don't even joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's actually, I think, a fascinating question. Because you think, uh, if, if you use Facebook, right? Every time Facebook changes Facebook, everyone hates Facebook for a week. Then they go back, now this is how everyone uses Facebook. Any live services like that, right? And so I think it's a really fascinating puzzle for us to look at. Yeah. Let's say if we have the BARD. The BARD just isn't, isn't, is not stacking up. People, and this is the important thing. So there's two things at work. If we do a survey and people say, we don't like a class, the next step is to say, well, do people not like the class in a way that's hurting the game? So for instance, let's say 80% of people hate the bard. The bard sucks. I would never play a bard. But then when you ask people to say, hey, do you ever want to play a bard? Well, no, the 80% who hate the bard would, might say, I've never wanted to play a bard. No interest. <laughs> I'm out, right? The 20% who say, hey, the bard's actually fun, they might actually be saying, yeah, I, I, want, I like playing the bard. And I'm really happy with this version of the Bard. Because, for instance, maybe the typical D&D player, like you know, the three pillars we had before, maybe, I'm not gonna make something up. People like them equally. Like I like a third combat, third role play, interaction, third exploration. There might be 20% of our players who are like, I like 100% interaction. And the Bard's awesome at that. So I'm the guy who just wants to role play, come up with an interesting character, and I love playing the Bard because it really enables that. Well, the person who plays the fighter might look at the Bard and say the, fighter, the Bard sucks, sucks in combat, that's what I like. So that's kind of the first step. Being more data-driven lets us go, hey, what's actually happening? Who's saying this is a problem, and why do we think they're saying it's a problem? Now let's say we actually find something, there is actually something wrong with the Bard. The next step is where things actually get really interesting, because there's a lot of ways we can do it. What I think we don't want to do is say, hey, let's rewrite the entire game, or relaunch the game, because only this one thing is having issues. So what can we do in an environment where we kind of think there's a live service? What can we do not only to fix the problem in a way that's as disrupt it has the least amount of disruption as possible, but also gets to the heart of the issue. So there are some things we might do, and I'm now this is more theoretical, but we yeah, might we're, we're kind of still figuring a lot of this out, actually. Yeah, because we haven't run into this problem yet, right? So we're kind of like, it's over the hill, and we're, you know, like, it, one of the themes you may have seen was, we got good at this at the end. Yeah. So and that, I think, is the, the true of every element of human endeavor, right? As you do it more, you get better at it, and you're the, like, the day you die is the day you figured it all out, right? <laughs> like, that's, real nice. yeah. That's right. So what we might do, though, is something like, um, well, first, we want to take things very slowly. What we absolutely don't want to do is say, hey, the bard's broken. OK, let's throw a fix out there. That actually didn't fix the problem. OK, great. We made everyone do all this stuff, this work, read this stuff, and it didn't actually solve anything. So there'll definitely be a playtest component to it, where if we had a fix, we would release it first, then get feedback, then assess whether, hey, this is fixed, do what it's supposed to do. And possibly even multiple times, right, an yeah. iteration. Yeah, exactly, iterate on it. And then what I think most likely to happen then would depend on the degree. If it's a universal problem that everyone has, we'd probably push it out there as a free download. Like, hey, here's, here's a new thing to add. And it's most likely would be something additive. So the bard, because we have these subclasses built into the classes, we might say, hey, here's a new college that a bard player can choose. And we recommend using this in your campaign because it does x, y, and z. Um, that also might work for, let's say, for instance, and this is actually the things I think are much harder to solve. Let's say 35% of people say they don't like the bard. 
is that enough people that it's actually something we need to address? And that's where things get really interesting. Like, because the 80% of people hate it, well, that's easy. No one, everyone hates it, and if we fix it, we'll look like heroes. People say thank you, right? They'll, they want it fixed. But if only 35% hate it, well, if we don't do anything, does that become 40, 50, does that go up? Uh, is that enough of a barrier that people just aren't happy with the game overall? And so finding the, what's the, the correct approach? What I think you're gonna see us do to start with is do things where like, hey, here's a new option you can add into the game. Maybe we'll lose it for free online. I think that probably the ideal, and yeah. again, especially for anything that's really like, hey, it's widespread. Yeah. But here's a new thing you can use if in your campaign DM, you have a problem, like you have a player who wants to play a bard and they're just like, you're kind of noticing they're not having fun, try using this. Or, you know, here is a new, like, hey, we found monsters are, you know, uh, high level characters aren't really being challenged. Well, here are some new monsters we've designed that are part of this new campaign where that's supposed to work. Taking a little bit more measured approach and using that feedback cycle to really guide how we do things. Because again, especially for a game like D&D, the game design is probably actually a third of the actual end, end result. You know, then I think you know, presentation and then the culture around the game, keeping those things vibrant, have to be things where we have to take those into, into account and weigh them equally with the game design in how we come up with something that we hope is the solution to a problem. Yeah, so. and Mike sort of touched on it briefly, but I think the idea of optional rules is another one that we'd want to leverage, right? So if it is a small number of people or a, a third of the people that have a problem with it, Treating it as an optional rule, like we do with feats or multi-class or something like that, I think is probably uh, one of the first things we want to explore. Just from the standpoint of those 66% of the people that don't have a problem with it, just get to ignore it because it's an option. Yeah, and that's actually something which I think is, is, is dangerous for us. We have to really watch out for. We don't want to turn things into problems if they're not a problem in your table. Yeah. If you're not using the bar in your campaign, or you have that guy who's playing the bar who actually likes it because you're playing like you know I, I played this game. The characters run a restaurant in a city. Like, there's no actual fighting monsters because there are a bunch of people running a restaurant and trying to sabotage their competitors. So it actually doesn't come up that, you know, this class is really awesome in combat or whatever. It actually might be something like, hey, this class is actually kind of boring to play because it doesn't have many social interaction options, yeah. which might actually be fine because that's just, you know, that's how that class is defined. In this campaign, that class just doesn't fit. So, you have any other question right back here? Uh, so, uh, I have like, maybe a funny like, rules or question for sure. uh, Bobby. I know D&D Next is a little more free form, but I actually have like, a serious question as well. Um, so for fighters that can fight with two weapons, can they hit different enemies in one round of combat with each weapon? Yeah, okay, absolutely. So <laughs> the, uh, does the attack bonus only apply to the first weapon, the second weapon, or both? Uh, the attack bonus or the damage bonus? The, uh, I guess, the damage bonus. Uh, so if it's normal two weapon fighting, you can absolutely, so I guess I'm back. The way 2-weapon fighting works is uh, if you're holding the right weapons, you can use your action to attack and then use your bonus action to attack with the other one. There's no targeting restrictions. So you could totally attack the same guy or two different guys, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to the damage bonus, if you don't have the fighting style or the feat, then yeah, it would only apply to one of the targets. Okay, cool, thanks. No problem. And then, we're, you guys have so much content, uh, all the way back to first edition, that's uh, like amazing, like, a lot of the modules and stuff. And, uh, have you thought about like what the solution is for people that aren't as uh, savvy with like the rules, especially the rough table ones? For like, hey, I want to upconvert like this precision module to the next. How can I go through my monster manual, make sure this is balanced, make sure the stats feel right, make sure the uh, amount of treasure I'm receiving feels right? So uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people that engage in that type of play that have to do like a lot of groundwork to just get those things like updated. Is there like a yeah, we're actually working right now on conversion guides for earlier editions. So the uh, there'll also be like things like the, the DMG will have advice on like typical treasure and things like that. So because we definitely know people yep. either converting campaign. And we do it, use. right? Yeah, we, we do it ourselves, yeah. right? The um, yeah, so definitely having that vault of adventures and content is a huge strength. We def definitely want to leverage it. We it, it's uh, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, we're definitely a text file. You know, something you could read and go along with. The, um, the one kind of challenge we have with anything that's a digital tool is just, we, we were not really, at least on the D&D side, not much, but we're not a software company, so we'd have to look at partnering with someone. So it's always just a matter of like, where does that fall? Like right now we're with a company called Trapdoor to do tools for Deeper Fifth. So it kind of comes down to like, where in the queue of features do, do they want to put that? So, cool. Thank you. so I think we had a question here next, then I'll go here, then back. Okay. Um, so this is kind of part of this question. And I know that other like role-playing games and even card games kind of face this issue. 
One of the things that I really liked um, creating a character in this one is how easy it was, but I've also created characters in previous D&D games that took a monstrously long time to do. So what if you have a person who wants to actually continue with the characters and campaigns that they've been doing, and you know they, they like these characters, they've been with them a long time, but they want to try the new game, or they see something in the rules that sounds like a lot of fun, and that's how they want to continue their adventures. Is there any honest way that they would be able to transfer their characters from one version to the other, or would they have to really start with new characters? Yeah, it, it's really tricky. It depends on how far afield the players have gone from, say, the player's handbook for a given edition. So our rule of thumb in working on FIP was we wanted everything that showed up in a player's handbook in some format to have some version of an analog in 5th edition of the player's handbook that you could go to. So for instance, there's, there isn't a warlord character class in 5th, but if you look at the Battlemaster fighter, there are maneuvers there that duplicate a lot of what the warlord does. The, the trick comes if you're, like, you're using like a complete book or, you know, uh, um, and not blank in the titles, but like psionics and things like that. It's just kind of nature of the beast. That it's just it's going to take us a while to catch up to the depth of content other editions have had. And it's also, like I talked about earlier, we're not going to be doing as much, as much mechanical, as many mechanical options. So one of the things we're looking at is, we, and we did some surveys on stuff like this, what classes and races were people using beyond the core, what prestige classes, what character concepts. So there is a plan in place like to try to get the stuff that's the most popular. But with any addition shift, there would be, there, there's probably going to be some element of, well, what's the best fit? What's the thing that's closest to your character concept? Kind of stepping away a little bit from the rules and then seeing, well, the, how does this translate over? There are some math tricks you can kind of do, like just knowing like, well, here's what a fifth level character's hit points typically are, and things like that. But the tricky part is really any of the exceptions-based mechanics, where it's just, oh, here's some new, 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 unique ability that like, the wilder gets, or that the soul knife can use. So it's definitely something we're aware of. It just really just comes down to that tension between hitting the quality levels we want versus how much content we can actually do. The, um, you know, I, I know what some people do is maybe just import, I mean, one of the things you can look at doing is, is importing mechanics from fifth into whatever version you're playing now. You know, are there things like advantage to replace modifiers, things like that, if that's kind of where, where your group wants to go. But it's just kind of one of those things where it's, just, it's hard for us to like match, because we know someone out there is playing like a Zeph Soul Knife, which is like, okay, the Zeph race and the Soul Knife class, like within Psionics, which is another entire optional system that we're not going to get to for a bit. It's just going to be a matter of time before we can really give you that one for one update. 